Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, appreciate y'all being here today. Start with a brief opening statement and be happy to take any questions. Um, I think the first order of business is probably talking about our quarterback situation. Uh, we made an internal decision uh, and it really wasn't that hard. I think Brennan Lewis had a tremendous camp. It might be the first time I, in 30 years of doing this that we've gone through an entire camp and a quarterback hasn't thrown one interception. And so I think that's the one thing that stood out to me the most was the growth that Brennan has shown in terms of understanding how to take care of the football, manage and run the offense. I think having Coach Lubick here um, has really helped to kind of bring that side of the ball together. And I also think that David Gilbertson's done a really nice job with that group. I think A.J. Bianco had a really good camp, and, uh, but I think it was a clear, there was a clear separation between B. Lou and the rest of the quarterbacks. Um, you know, the obvious, uh, the obvious question is, well, what, where's Chubba in the mix? And unfortunately, Chubba, week two, um, had, a, had a, an issue with a shoulder, non-surgical, want to obviously act out of an abundance with ca of caution based on his injury history. And so, um, you know, we're kind of bringing him along slowly. He'll have, a, he'll have an MRI early next week, and we're very hopeful that that'll kind of put him in mode of let's start getting him ready to go again. So uh, that's kind of where we're at on the quarterback situation. We'll release a two deep tomorrow. Uh, I think SMU is going to release theirs as well. So we'll release our two deep at that point in time. And, uh, you know, shoot, man, I just think about this game and I think about what an unbelievable opportunity this is, not just for a football program, but really the community of Reno, Northern Nevada, and this great university. Um, at 5 o'clock on Saturday, we're the only game in town. If you like college football and you turn the TV on and you want to watch a game, there's only one to watch. And so it, this can be an unbelievable commercial for this university, for our community, and for all of Northern Nevada. And so uh, I really encourage you know, uh, members of our community, hey, if you're on the fence about, hey, what, should I go to this game or not? Absolutely, you should go to this game. Um, it's a it's a beginning of a new era of, of Wolfpack football, but it's also an opportunity to, to showcase uh, our university, the spirit and the pride of this place. And uh, hopefully we can have a great turnout and uh, be uh, somewhat gracious hosts for the SMU Mustangs. Uh, turning our attention to them, they're an 11 win football team from a year ago and they returned nine of their 11 starters on offense. So this is a team that was a top 10 scoring and red zone offense a year ago that has not really missed a beat. Um, their quarterback is, I'm assuming he's gonna be healthy, he missed some time at the end of the year last year. Really efficient player. They have excellent skill. Um, I think there's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a team that, you know, we've gotta make them earn it. They, they thrive on explosive plays. That gets them into their tempo offense. They've got an offensive minded head coach. And, uh, and they're, you know, they're, they're dangerous. They're a very dangerous football team. They're a power five football team that's resting just outside the top 25. And I'm sure they want to make a statement early on in the season to put them in position um, to, to make some noise down the stretch. And so offensively, they prevent, present kind of a multitude of issues. The tempo, uh, unbalanced formations, uh, just the speed and athleticism that they have on the perimeter of wide receiver. They run a lot of gap schemes in the run in the run game, so you got to do a great job of fitting counter and power. They will run the quarterback a little bit, and so they're very and they're very balanced. I think there's a perception that maybe this is a pass happy offense, and they're not. They're uh, you know I think Red is kind of a um, you know a lot of people are going to say well air raid because some of his roots date back to his days at Texas Tech, but you know I see a lot more Gus Malzahn, and Gus is much more of a balanced guy. I mean they're almost 50 50 run pass from last year. And I think that's what you're going to see from them on offense. Uh, they do create a lot of explosives. They're going to push the ball down the field vertically. And when they do get an explosive, you can anticipate them going fast. And so it's really important for us to try to win first down and uh, keep them off schedule and out of their tempo. That's, those are things that I think you can pay attention to for us from a defensive standpoint. Uh, when you turn the attention to their defense, uh, I think it's, it's very underrated, man. I think this is a really good outfit. They were top 12 in scoring defense a year ago. Uh, they don't return quite as many starters, but they may have added more pieces through the portal than they did than they had to on offense. Uh, their defensive line is active and uh, and very talented. I think that's the best unit on their defense. They have athletic linebackers and they have good skill in the back end. So I think this is a uh, I love the way these guys play. The guys play defense. They're not overly complicated on mixed downs. Primarily, they're going to play post safety, but they do what they do really well and they run to the ball, and they tackle well, and they play physical. So I admire what they do on defense, and uh, they present a variety of challenges just in terms of matchups from that standpoint as well. So a very talented football team that's coming to Mackey and uh, an opportunity for us to, to go out and, and find out what we got. And I think that's going to be the whole thing. It's like, how do we respond to the tempo of the game? And I'm not just talking how fast they run plays, 
I'm talking just the speed of the game is hard to simulate in even in practice situations, especially when you're going up against kind of taking a step up in competition like we are. I think tackling always shows up in first games. You know, who's going to be the better tackling team? Usually you see a lot of missed tackles early on because everybody's adjusting to the speed. I think turnovers are always going to be a, a, a huge factor. And then special teams. And uh, I think, you know, they've got a new punter. Uh, we have a new punter. Uh, they return their kicker. It'll be interesting to see. You kind of almost have to get live scouts on these guys. I think the, the, the kick chart's not going to be as relevant. You know, they're playing a lot of games at or near sea level. And being at almost a mile high, that ball's probably going to carry a little bit more, knowing that the wind's going to come out of the north pretty much consistently here in Mackey. And uh, so I think we're going to have to get a little bit of a good live scout in pregame, as are they, to see kind of where we want to set our returners up and how aggressive we want to be in that phase. And uh, it, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge. But uh, as I said, you know, we've got, we've got an, a great opportunity, and I think it's a great opportunity for the community of Reno to come together and have a party at 5 o'clock in Mackey on, uh, on Saturday the 24th. Happy to take any questions. A lot of Mountain West schools will kind of open with an FCS opponent. Obviously, you guys have a much bigger challenge. I guess what are the pros and cons with starting against the team that's this talented? Yeah, well, I think we're going to find out a lot about ourselves. Uh, we're going to find a lot out about not just not just what we do well schematically, but how we play. What is our competitive character? How mature are we as competitors? You know, there's going to be moments in every game, no matter how how elite the competition is that you're going against, where things are not going to go your way. And football, more than any other game, is a huge game of momentum. So when the momentum's on their sideline, how do we respond? That's what that's the biggest thing I'm going to pay attention to in this game. And one of the things that I think is pretty obvious is that you know we have an interesting schedule. We play five non-conference preseason games, essentially. Then we have a bye, and then we have our Mountain West schedule. And I've kind of looked at that like we've got a long runway to figure out our identity. What do we do well in all three phases? Who are our playmakers? How do we help them to give us a chance to impact the game in a positive way for us, right? How are we maturing as a, as a team in terms of our, our competitive nature, really? And then, you know, are we improving week to week? Are we getting better at fundamental football? Are we becoming smarter football players? Are we playing with better pad level? Are we tackling better? Are we sticking to blocks? Are we, are we tighter on our vertical cuts? The little things that make a big difference in a football game. And so I think uh, that's kind of how I look at this. Like, you know, you know Brendan's the starter week one. Well, we got five weeks of preseason. There's a lot of things that can happen between now and then. And I think that's one thing that uh, should give our guys hope. I think, you know, we've got to play a lot of guys in these five non-conference games to find out who the guys are that we can count on in competitive situations. You mentioned Brendan didn't throw an interception the entire fall. The entire fall count. Now he tried. He tried. And Keaton Crawford dropped a couple, but you got to catch them or they don't count. But his, yeah, his his accuracy. Um, you know, one of the things I'll share with you is that, you know, I think there was a question mark maybe even within the locker room about, hey, how hard are is is he preparing? How hard is he working? There is no doubt that he was the hardest working member of our football team this fall camp. That guy was in the team room, in between practices, in between walkthroughs, uh, every single day. And he did it intentionally. He didn't go back in a corner room where nobody could see him working. He made sure that when everybody walked through the team room, they saw their starting quarterback or who he hoped would become the starting quarterback in there grinding and out, watching the tape and preparing. And I think that uh, I think that won over a lot of the guys in the locker room. And I think that his preparation showed day in and day out in fall camp. Where do you think that added maturity came from? Is that something that you guys had discussed coming out of spring? I think there's a lot of I – mean, he's, he's getting older. You know, his, his – uh, you know, his three yard run starting to kind of shrink a little bit, if that makes sense. So as you get to understand that analogy and, and, uh, you know, I think he also sees a new opportunity. You know, I think he's, I think, you know, coach Gilbertson's done a really good job with him. I think he really likes what we're doing on offense and how Matt approaches, you know, keeping reads simple for the quarterback, giving them rhythm throws. Um, and, uh, and I, I just think that he sees like, Hey, this is, if, if I'm going to do it, now's the time. I mean, what am I waiting for? You know? Been in college three years. I've got an opportunity here, and let's let's take advantage of it. And so, I think he's matured. I'd like to hope that some of the things that we've done, uh, in terms of having bringing in people for him to work with, um, you know, just to, in terms of a performance coaching, whether that be Phil Kornichuk or, or other people that we've kind of surrounded himself him and other and other players that we have in our program with. Uh, I'd like to hope that some of that work has been is is going to pay off as well. I know you guys will release your duty tomorrow, but is, is AJ the backup at this point, or? Yeah, AJ will be the backup going into the SMU game. Do you expect to play multiple quarterbacks, or is it just kind of see how it goes? No, I really don't. Uh, I think that would that would be a, a, you know dependent on how the game flow goes and the circumstances. I think this week, um, you know, that's that's not necessarily the plan. Um, 
but you know, you never know how the game's going to fold, unfold. And, and I do think that AJ's prepared himself, and he'll be ready to go. And as is Griggs. I mean, I think all three of those guys would be capable of running our offense in an efficient way. What part of the team would you say is the furthest along that you're most comfortable with right now? I think just the depth is the running back room. We just have so many guys that have played major college football, and so um, that's that's probably the room that you go, okay. We've got a little bit more bandwidth in that room than we do some others. What about where the biggest room is to improve, I guess? Um, you know, I think that's always going to – I mean, I think we all have room to improve in every area. I think there's just a lot of untested things. Like we've got I, – I really like our defensive backfield, but we've got a lot of guys that maybe haven't played on this stage. And so uh, you could say the same about a number of positions in our, in our organization. And so, like, I'm all I'm, – this is very much an observation game for me. You know, I'm watching their body language. I'm watching how they respond when they get hit in the mouth. I'm watching how they respond when things are going well. Uh, I know the type of team that I want, and I'm realistic to know that it's not going to be there in its entirety week one. You know, it's going to be a work in progress, and uh, we've just got to make sure that we identify the behaviors that we want to have in our program, and we celebrate those behaviors, and then we correct the ones that we don't want. What positions do you think have improved the most since you got this job until this season opener? I think quarterback comes to mind. I think offensive line comes to mind. I mean, I don't think there's a position that hasn't improved. I mean, we're like, – this is a, not even – it's night and day from what it was in the spring, both in terms of who the people are out there, you know, 30-something, 40-something new guys, and, uh, and in terms of their understanding of how we want to go about practice, how we do our preparation, you know, what the expectation is in the locker room and out in the community and things like that. So I think it's – I think there's been vast improvement across the board. But if you were to say one on the offensive side, without doubt, it's receiver. But you could also make an argument that's more we brought better people in the room as far as players. Um, and, uh, and on the defensive side, you know, I'd probably say, you know, I'd probably say edge. You know, and again, there's good talent there too. Um, in terms of people who would be on the two deep who might not be available due to injury, I guess how healthy do you guys enter this game? We've, we've gotten pretty fortunate. I think uh, we had some guys that were out for quite a while. And uh, we're starting to get some of those guys back. Andrew Savanna, who's not been involved a lot, is the last week and a half has started to kind of, you know, reacclimate to college football again. Uh, Patrick Garwo, we're you know coming off an injury, we were very cautious with him. He's back to full go. So there's some of those types of guys. I really don't see guys that are too deep guys that uh, that are not going to be available at all. Now they they may be a little bit limited. And they may have a pitch count on them, but uh, but I don't see guys that are in the two deep that are significant for us that are not going to be available. Sean Dollars was, it seemed like, limited recently. Yeah, he's he right? back full yesterday. So, yeah, we, we kind of dodged a bullet there. Thought it was a high ankle. It wasn't. It was just a medial ankle. And he's back rolling. He's got fresh legs. Probably not a bad thing to take a, a veteran and give him a few days off before we get into game week. You mentioned their explosive passing attack and not allowing big plays. I guess what will be the keys to making them you know, earn it eight to ten play series rather than Well, they're going to take their shots. I mean, I don't. It doesn't matter what we do. That's their DNA. They're going to, they're going to have 11 to 13 vertical plays a game. Um, You know, whether those are dialed up shots out of 12 personnel, whether that's just seeing a a single safety in a press corner and they're going to throw it up. And so, you know, we've got to, we've got to pick and choose when we put our guys on islands. We've got to be smart about that, obviously. Um, And then, you know, we've got to, we've got to try to not get in, not allow the play caller to get in rhythm with us. We've got to. You know, show them different looks. We can't live and die. Even in even in tempo, we can't live and die in one look. Or they're gonna they're gonna identify the matchup that they want, and they're gonna exploit that. And so, uh, I think that's really the critical aspect of it is not putting our guys in bad spots. We have to put them in positions. That doesn't mean that we're not gonna call an aggressive game. That means that we can't do it down after down after down. You had mentioned uh, identity of your team as well. I guess what do you want that identity to emerge into by the end of this season? Well, I think this. I think I want to. I mean, really. I want our program to be defined by two words, toughness and discipline. Those are the two things that I want this program to be about. And if, uh, if us, and I'm not just talking about physical toughness, being able to take an emotional blow and respond quickly in an appropriate fashion, being resilient, right? And uh, I think that's something that, you know, when you have a program that's struggled as we have over the last couple of years, that's the first thing that's going to be, that's the first chink in the armor, that here we go again mentality. Like, I don't care. I really don't care what the scoreboard says at the end of this game. The only thing I care about is how we play, how we represent the University of Nevada, how hard we play, how disciplined we play, showing resilience and mental toughness and then physically getting after it. That's the only thing that matters, you know? And if we we feel good about the effort 
the toughness and the discipline that we played with, then we'll grow from there. And that's the objective. I'm sure you inherited a group that didn't have a lot of belief given 4 and 20 the last two seasons. How have you seen that belief among these guys and your team as a whole kind of change as you get closer to the start of the season? Yeah, I think, well, confidence comes from success. I mean, that's the reality of it, right? But I think it also comes from trust. And then knowing how I'm going to respond, being as consistent as I can be. You know, if I'm a roller coaster coach, we're going to have a roller coaster team. And so trying to be really, really consistent and intentional about my approach to these young men uh, when I speak with them uh, one on one, holding them to a high standard, holding them accountable. I think it starts with our best players or the guys that are perceived to be the best players in the locker room. I intentionally make examples out of them. I'm not going to go after the walk on freshmen for not having the right dress in the weight room or not using the type of energy and effort that we want on the practice field. Um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that our best players are, are providing the right example for our program because if they're doing it right, everybody's going to fall in line. And if I allow them to do it wrong, we're not making progress. So I think it's being really consistent and firm with the expectations and standards that we have. And over time, that confidence builds like, hey, I know what coach I'm going to get out of coach. I know that's what I'm going to get. If I do this, I'm going to get this. And then pretty soon, the standards start to rise, and then their confidence builds because their skill gets better, if that makes sense. And so, uh, you know, there's going to be a moment this season. I don't know what game it is. I don't know when it is. It might be Saturday. It might not. That the light's going to come on, and these guys are going to start to play with more belief and more confidence. And, uh, and that's just the nature of a competitive environment, right? You know? And so um, I'm looking forward to that moment. Competitive maturity is something you talked about a lot. How has that come along since we kind of last night time? and day, night and day? I think they heard my message loud, loud and clear. You know, front runners are the ones that run their mouth and and get in shoving matches and and try to grandstand. Finishers are the ones that let their pads do the talking. And we've made tremendous strides in that area. You kind of touched on it throughout, but what will it take for you to walk off the field Saturday and say that was a success? What does that look like? I don't know. We'll get to Saturday. I mean, got to watch the film, got to see, like I said, I mean, how they play is what's important to me. I'll have a pretty good feel for it after the game. Um, I think I've got a reasonably well-trained eye, but by the same time, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of details that show up. Like, you know, hey, did you see the backside tackle climb into the safety on that screen and straining to finish? Or did he not? Did he hang it up? Did he take that play off? And so those are the things that are going to be important and impactful for me to see, um, you know, next Sunday. You personally, just the excitement of being head coach again, putting on that headset and having you know eight months in the in the books here in town and getting ready for a game. How, how do you feel? I guess. Yeah, I feel like uh, I'm exhausted. If I'm being honest with you, like this is I, eight months. It seems like an eternity. Um, the way you know the zero week, not having a little bit more time off in the summer. Year one, you've got so much more to do, and so I'm looking forward to a year from now. If I'm being honest with you. So I know it's coming, and it's uh, you know year one's always going to be some heavy lifting, and we've done a lot of that heavy lifting already. Um, I'll be excited on game day, uh, but hopefully I'll be poised as well. You kind of talked about like your high energy during practice, and then like game days are for the players, and maybe your uh, personality changes. I guess what is your personality on a game day, and does that change? Yeah, I, I mean, I, again, I try to be really consistent, and, I, and my personality in general has changed. I mean, when I was 34. You know, I was a lunatic out there on the practice field, right? And uh, coaching linebackers and special teams and, you know, like your roles change, right? As your roles change, your demeanor has to change. I can't be that guy. And so trying to be really intentional. When I talk, I have something to say. You know, I'm not talking just, just to talk. Uh, I don't think yelling is coaching. I really don't. I challenge our coaches on that a lot. Um, I think that, you know, if I really want to make a point, I'm going to bring a kid over and put my arm around him and whisper in their ear. Right? That's going to get the point across a lot more than me screaming and yelling at them. They're probably not even going to hear me anyway. And so I think being really intentional about my communication with our players, being really intentional about our communication with our staff. I told our coaches yesterday, we did our Sunday reset, and they said, well, you know, gosh, you're really calm. And I said, I said, it takes more energy for me to just have a really calm demeanor than it does for me to do what I'm naturally kind of prone to do, which is to get excited and emotional. And so that takes a lot of self-discipline, and I think I've learned that over time. And so um, on game day, hopefully, I'm under control. I'm not losing my mind on the officials. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, if a series doesn't go well, I'm not, you know, telling Matt that, you know, jump out of the booth, buddy. We're going to go to another play call. You know, just have some maturity about what we're going on, what we're about to do, and have poise and composure. And I think that's sometimes that's my biggest challenge, and that takes more mental energy for me than anything. 
And so, um, because I know what, you know, it's easy for me to light the fire. It's harder for me to suppress that and be focused and poised and composed. Have you guys selected captains for this season? We'll have game captains. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, each week we'll select a group of captains for the game um, based on kind of, you know, how did they represent the core values of our program? And so that'll be something that'll maybe be a little bit different and new. I always find it hard year one to do permanent captains. You know, you just don't have a long runway with these kids. And, um, you know, especially early in the year, things are great, you know, and then you know, we meet some struggles. Well, who are the guys that are really going to show their medal in the right way? And uh, I'm hopeful that we have a lot of those young men in our program. Um, but I know that if we, if we kind of take this approach that week by week, the guys that are kind of exemplifying the values that we want to have and, and, and be living examples of the culture that we want here, then we're rewarding those guys on a weekly basis. And I think our season captains then will vote on those at the end of the year, and they'll emerge through the course of these 13 games. Uh, like sideline props have become a big thing in college football. Do you guys have one? This you know, I am the worst guy in the world when it comes to stuff like that. So, like, I don't know. Like, we are going to have – we are going to have, there'll be a press release, is that on you know, Thursday, is that when we're doing that? Thursday. We'll talk about something that we're doing to lead our team out, which I think is pretty significant and it's impactful. Uh, and I, I like things that have, you know, that have bandwidth, that have like there's a history, a tradition behind it. Like I don't know that there's a history or tradition behind a turnover belt or whatever. I think those are a little passe. Uh, but if it gets the kids fired up, whatever, I don't care. I'm not going to be a part of it. So um, that's more, ask Kane that question, I guess, is a better answer for me. What do you make of SMU's QB room? It seems like it's obviously more than just Stone out there that could potentially be thrown at you, get yeah. one. Yeah, I could see Seven, the guy that's finished the year for him. I mean, that guy's a very talented player, very good athlete that can spin it. Um, I think whoever's in that room, they're going to have talent. You know, I mean, this is a this is an ACC team that, you know, has deep pockets and can be active in the portal and does a really good job of evaluating and recruiting. And, and quite honestly, I don't want to minimize the job, you know, that, that Coach Lashley's done there by saying that they just go out and buy players, because I don't believe that. I think he's done a tremendous job of building the culture. You watch them play defense. Like, if you want to know what a team's all about, what's the heartbeat of it, man? A lot of guys can do a lot of cool things on offense, depending on what their toys are. But the way they play, they play a physical brand of football on both sides. Uh, you can tell that they've done, done a really good job of, you know, when they have gotten into the portal, they've done, done it in a way that's been intentional, and they've got guys that fit what they want to do and have the personality that they want to play with. So, um, you know, it doesn't matter who they roll out there, they're going to have talent. About the numbers, you guys will go in as underdogs. Uh, do you feel like this is a squad that can wear that title well in game number one? I think we're going to be underdogs in every game. I, I think that. Like maybe by the end of the year, we'll have opened some eyes. And hey, you know these guys maybe aren't underdogs anymore. I don't know. Um, but you know, number one, you know, I don't think we're supposed to worry about what the spread is. Number two, I would totally expect that, right? You know, I mean, I mean, given who we're our, our recent past, right? And so I think that's okay. You know, that's okay. We'll, we'll, we know who we are. We'll play with a chip on our shoulder and, and uh, go see how it goes. Outside of what we're going to hear about, it, it sounds like on Thursday, can you just take us through what game week looks like for you guys? And specifically also maybe the day before the game, if you guys have any traditions or anything you're going to try to do? Yeah, so we're a little bit different in that. So we practice, we have a, like a real practice on Monday. Um, it's, it's a little shorter. We're in helmets and spiders. But we get through quite a bit. We do some game plan stuff. Uh, Tuesday's kind of your every Tuesday, everywhere in America practice, you know, mixed downs, coverage units. Wednesday is kind of your every Wednesday, everywhere in the country Wednesday. Um, and then we take Thursday off. That's our players' day off. And I found that doing it later in the week, they get a little bit more refreshed. Um, and when they come in early in the week and they want to get extra film study, we're still in the process of formulating the game plan, right? And once it's later in the week, like, hey, here's the call sheet. Take 20 minutes and go in there and go right through the third downs or whatever the case may be. And so I think, uh, I think it also gets the coaches a little bit more fresh leading into game day. And then Friday is a combination of what would be a walkthrough on a normal Friday at most institutions and a Thursday practice. So we kind of combine those two. So we'll bring the guys in. We'll have a, we'll have a script walkthrough, uh, go through situations. They'll go in. They'll dress, tape, we'll have a special teams meeting, we'll work on situational stuff in that meeting as well, and then we'll go out and have about an hour and 15 minute practice. We'll have two scout periods and two crossover service periods during that, and then we intermix the special teams. So um, our, our, our Fridays are, are a good chunk, right? So we're kind of activating them the day before the game. And then Friday night, you know, we don't stay in hotels so um, it, on home games, so 
we'll come in here and we'll go to the silver blue. We'll eat dinner. We'll have an offense defensive meeting. I'll talk to the team and then uh, we'll send them off to, you know, their house and let them sleep in their own bed. And then we'll get up on Friday and play. So I don't know that there's any, there's any specific traditions or anything like that. I mean, um, one thing I know and doing this as long as I have, there's no magic bullet doesn't matter. I mean, it's, it's about preparation and execution. And those are the things that matter on game day. Not using a hotel? Is there anything? Am I in a hotel? Is that what no, you're... no, no. Just Ask that. my wife. I don't know. <laughs> Traditionally, you know, the team will stay in a hotel. Home yeah, road. yeah. I'm trying to. Uh, here's what we're doing. Okay, that I'm saving a little over one hundred fifty thousand dollars, and I'm putting that into nutrition. So that's a that's a budgetary. You know, I mean, I think it's well documented where we're at in terms of competitive investment in the Mountain West uh, with our football program, and I think that's one of the ways that I can be a good steward of the resources that we have and make decisions that are going to have the most impact for our players. And that doesn't, you know, we're still feeding them. They're still getting a good meal. We're still sending them home with a snack, all that kind of stuff. The only thing is we're not, you know, staying in a hotel. We're not using the expenses of taking the buses back and forth. And so um, I think that's, there's always more than one way to do it. You know, I mean, if we're, you know, where do we, I get a, I get a budget. I decide how that budget's spent. And, um, you know, there's things that maybe we can, I'm not going to use the word cut corners because I don't think that's cutting corners. We're doing everything that we would do. But I know I sleep a lot better in my own bed, and hopefully our players will be mature enough to be able to handle that as well. And if they're not, you know, then we'll, we'll adjust. This Wolfpack football fan base has obviously been through a lot the last few seasons. They lost the coach to a conference rival, back to back to intense seasons, I guess. You know, how important is it to get Mackey back filled, and what do you think it's going to take to get Wolfpack fans, I guess, confident in the direction of this program? Yeah, I think, obviously, giving them uh, – kind of a marquee game, I would think that would be a part of it, right? Hey, bringing them back, them having a really good game day experience because, you know, the days of going, buying a ticket just for the game are over, right? It's, it's about the experience too. And so people having a really good experience, hey, the parking was good. I, I enjoyed the food in the concourse, the, the fireworks or whatever the heck else they got going on in between series uh, was, was great. Our, our kids had fun. You know, I think that the, the overall experience is just as important as the product on the field. I don't know if I agree or disagree with that, but that's a big part of it, right? But the draw is still going to be, are you winning or not, right? That's still the draw. Are we playing significant, impactful games in November because there's a conference title opportunity on the line or a bowl opportunity on the line? Um, I think those are the things that are, that are going to be interesting. And I think that how we play, again, is going to be the determining factor. Is it a product that people in northern Nevada can be proud of? You know, and, and if, if we do that the right way, you know, we'll, we'll, bring, the, we'll bring the fan base back. Um, and it's kind of chicken or the egg, right? Like, okay, is it we invest in the program and, and people show up and then they win? Or is it we got to win and then they'll invest in the program and we'll bring the people back? I, I think it's probably the latter. And I'm well aware of that. I was like, like you know, I'm, I was not naive when I took this job. I knew it was going to be a steep mountain to climb. And so, um, but I think we've got a good plan for how to do it. There was a report out that the group of five commissioners are going to meet this week to talk about a potential group of five playoff. Obviously, the ultimate goal is to get into the 12-team college football playoff. But would you be in favor of the group of five having a separate? Well, playoff? until 2032, we are. The, the group of five does have a slot, right? Yeah. So, so that's already present. Now, it's how do you want to, how do you want to select that team? Right now, it's the highest-ranked conference champion, correct? Um, from the group of five that would have an opportunity to get into the 12-team playoff. So I think that's the decision, right, that the commissioners and the presidents of the universities have to make is, hey, do we want to stick with the plan that's already in place through 2032, or do we want to create something that maybe captivates a different audience and, uh, and find some dead air in those weeks before bowl games start to be played where we can have our playoff system in place and then the winner of that playoffs then gets an opportunity to get into the 12 team. Now there's some things that are going to have to happen if that choice is made and that's clearly made well above my pay grade. Um, you're going to have to go to an 11 team regular or 11 game regular season. So you're going to lose a non-conference game. You're probably going to have to go to week zero to play because there's a lot more eyeballs in that. And you're also going to create a longer runway for your playoff. Okay. And so, um, you know, are you giving up, a home game? Are you giving up a, a money game? What are you, you know, what's the cost benefit in that? And so again, um, you know, I'm very familiar. I mean, it's really the FCS playoff model, which, you know, certainly uh, Wolfpack fans of a certain age will understand. And, you know, I've, um, I grew up a big sky fan and I was a head coach in the big sky. So I understand that format. Playoff football is cool. It is. It's a, it's a, it's a cool deal. 
And uh, I think there's, there's a lot of scenarios that are going to have to be talked about because I don't think the movement is done, right? I mean, we don't even know what the House decision total fallout is yet. And so I think there's some other things that have to happen, but I do think that's definitely a, a conversation that's being had and probably should be had. Between the top-rated group of five champion going in and the playoffs, you know, leading into that person getting in, do you have a preference between those two? I, I, I think play in an office. I mean, I, I'll use Liberty as an example, right? Okay, Liberty's schedule last year, SMU can make an argument, a big argument, that they should have been in that game, right? Uh, now, they weren't going to get into the CFP because it was only four teams last year. But you could make an argument that, hey, they kind of got hosed on this deal because Liberty was undefeated, but who did Liberty play? Well, if Liberty had to go through a playoff system, would SMU have beat them in a playoff? I don't know. But they didn't play. Well, it would be cool if they did. And then you can say, hey, you know, we're comparing apples to apples. We're not saying this guy's comp schedule, strength of schedule was different than this guy. It's like, hey, we're in a playoff, winner take all. Got one more for coach. You don't strike me as a superstitious guy, but is there anything you, you do every game day or every week of a game or anything you have to do? Not really. No. I mean, I show up. Um, that's kind of it, you know. I mean, I think, uh, you yeah, know, I think there's little things, but not, any, not anything that's significant that I would say, you know, I wear a certain color of socks or, yeah, that's not really my thing. So.